All right, guys, it's Trabox Reviews. Coming at you guys with my review for Stranger Things Season 3, Episode 4. All right, so just first off, I do want to uh, say I'm trying to do these reviews daily, but I've been a little sick lately, so um, I am back, though. Hopefully, we uh, are going to be finishing this one up uh, very soon this season. Uh, but anyway, so we're halfway through now with episode four. I thought this episode was a bit disappointing, to be honest with you, though I did enjoy some of the kind of developments that are going on in this one. Um, uh, I especially liked you know, some things in this episode, but some things I really didn't, um, so it's a little bit tough to compare, but of course, we'll discuss all of that in this, uh, you know, kind of recap and review. Anyways, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts of this episode, and of course, you know, so far, what you're thinking, if you're uh, only up to this point, or if you watched a few ahead, what you kind of thought, um, you know, of this season, and how this one compares to other seasons, all that stuff. Love to hear your guys' thoughts on this season of Stranger Things. And if you enjoyed the review, please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Would really appreciate that as well. So, anyways, guys, let's get into a little bit of a recap here of the more uh, important moments of this episode. I'll go over that, then go over my rating, fair character, and some more overall thoughts and predictions of what could come next for this uh, season of Stranger Things. Again, like I said, we're officially halfway through now, and to be honest, not much has happened yet, but I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what happens. I feel like the I feel like the ending of this season is going to be more extreme and more kind of shocking than the other seasons, because at this point in the other seasons, a lot more stuff had happened, right? Uh, you know, Will had been taken in season one uh, from the first episode, right? And season two, I felt like it, it progressed a little bit faster as well. Um, you know, with Dustin and his whole demo dog type of thing going on there, and some other stuff, um, you know, Will becoming a host again, so anyways, let's get into, uh, where this episode starts off here, so, we see Nancy and Jonathan watch Miss Driscoll, uh, driven away in an ambulance after she has gone completely rogue, right, we saw this at the very end of last week's episode, or last week, <laughs> of, uh, of last episode, episode three, um, you know, where we saw her kind of eating these bags of fertilizer, right? Like, we find out she was the one, not the rats, who was, uh, or, or at least that she then was eating the fertilizer bags. I guess that hasn't been confirmed whether or not that is the case. But anyways, um, so they, they kind of watch her get, uh, driven away in that ambulance after they call 911, presumably. And so then we see this, uh, the, the uh, police officer guy, um, you know, who has always just kind of been comedic relief. Both of the, the uh, police guys, um, you know, on, on Hopper's uh, team there ha have been that in the series. But anyways, he says, you two want to explain to me what in the name of Jesus just happened here? I thought that was a really great line. Probably one of the funniest lines of the, se of the uh, season so far. Really hilarious. Anyways, and it's like, it's so true. It's like, what in the name of Jesus happened here, right? It's like, what is happening here? Anyways, um, and so I thought that was really great uh, reaction too to what happened, like, you know, I feel like it's an honest reaction. Like, what in the hell just happened? Anyways, so we resume then back at the abandoned building where uh, Heather's parents are tied up. Her dad tries begging her to help them, but she says there's no stopping it. Really interesting stuff. Um, you know, and, and of course we get this idea, right, that Heather and Billy are obviously not themselves. Um, obviously Heather is, uh, has been kind of transformed into this doppelganger or, or somewhat controlled by the mind flare at this point. Same with Billy. And so we knew in this scene that there was no chance of Heather stopping it because Heather's gone, right? Like the real Heather is gone. The one that the parents are trying to appeal to. So we see Billy and Heather walk away, leaving them there as the monster, who by the way looks massive now, like, I mean massive, like this thing looks huge, and I'm not sure if there's like more rat's gut, rat guts that have been attached to it now, but it looks bigger than before, I don't know. Anyway, so this monster arrives, and we see it kind of suction their faces with its arms. Again, I've compared this monster to somewhat of a, like, squid, octopus, spider, like, type of thing, right? And it kind of looks like that octopus in that it kind of has those, like, suctions on its arms, um, or, or legs, whichever you want to call it. So, anyways, I thought that was really interesting, the way that it just, like, suctions onto their face, and it, it's just, like, attached, like, they, you know, like, it, it's just on there. And then we see also that it looks like something's going through the arms 
into their faces or like you know into their body through the arms it looks like kind of this black liquid um or kind of black formula um and this was like really creepy so i'm wondering now like is this the process of making the doppelgangers or is this the process of kind of like putting the mind flare into them right so that they become a host I'm not exactly sure, and I'm not sure, you know, because, of course, we saw the way that Will was, right? The Mind Flayer in the Upside Down pretty much just, like, entered his mouth. But in this, it's not even entering their mouth. It's just, like, suctioning onto their face. Um, so I thought that was interesting, and, uh, and I thought, you know, maybe this means that at this point, the real them is then sucked into the Upside Down world, right? Where we probably saw Heather in the bathtub, right? Where Eleven saw her. That was the Upside Down, presumably. So I'm wondering then if it kind of sucks the, the real them into the upside down where the mind flare is and then it basically puts the mind flare into their body now in the real world. Anyways, really creepy scene there um, and I thought it was a really great way to start off the episode. They've been doing this over and over again, I believe in almost every episode now. Um, they start off with Billy and the monster in the building and then they end with Billy and the monster in the building uh, with something to do with Heather now as well. Uh, with her parents, so, um, and they do it again in this episode, so yeah, alright, so then we see Heather's dad, uh, who, by the way, I didn't connect this at first, but I saw this, uh, thing on, I think it was Twitter, um, talking about how it's the same guy, and I didn't connect that, but anyways, it is the same guy, uh, Heather's dad is the guy who is in charge of the Hawkins Post, I guess it is a small town after all, anyways, so Heather's dad, uh, fires Nancy and Jonathan from the paper, but, of course, we know it's not really Heather's dad, right? Is it his doppelganger? Is it kind of a mind flayer controlled version of himself? I'm not exactly sure, right? But it definitely is not him. We see in the scene, we see this kind of sudden rage from him uh, in this scene. And we see him, like, sweating profusely as well in this. Looks very hot. Um, and, and, and just, like, really like angry like and, and and not necessarily for a reason like you know i mean i think you know he has reason to be angry about the situation that play out here uh you know but he kind of looks like you know not normal right like not a human uh reaction to what happened pretty much right uh and nancy picks up on this we actually see you know like right right away we see a reaction in that scene but then also later as she tells jonathan she's kind of skeptical right like she picks up on this right away anyways so he lies to them and says Miss Driscoll is a paranoid schizophrenic, and that basically explains her eating the fertilizer. Now, I shouldn't say that he lies to her for sure, because, I mean, this could be the case. Like, Miss Driscoll could be an actual paranoid schizophrenic. We haven't found that out yet. But we also do know by the end of this one, where we see her kind of freaking out in the black veins in her face at the end in the hospital, we know that something is up here, you know, it's not just that she's a paranoid schizophrenic. Anyways, so Nancy doesn't buy it, right? She's still skeptical at this point, even though she just gets fired, um, you know, she, she's not buying it. She's not buying the story. Anyways, uh, then we see in the car, this was probably my least favorite scene of the episode. Um, I just, I don't know. The total Jonathan and Nancy thing really just kind of irked me in this episode. Um, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. And... Um, you know, and, and I think I understand where both of the characters are coming from. I just don't understand it from a writing perspective of why they're showing us this. Anyways, maybe later on in the season it will matter and it, and it will kind of, um, impact the way that Nancy is in the later parts of the season. But so far in this season, I mean, Nancy's been kind of a throwaway character. And same with Jonathan even so far. But like, Will hasn't been uh, a host or taken. So... Jonathan is kind of immediately taken out of the main plot this season and Nancy hasn't had much to do either And so I feel like this whole storyline of them and the paper and Miss Driscoll is just kind of something to throw in there to keep these characters relevant and This car scene really did played out and it just really was kind of frustrating to me So we see Jonathan is unhappy Right that she got them fired right because he says you know he needed the job but she didn't right he needed the job to pay for um you know school loans and all that stuff um but she didn't and she didn't appreciate you know that he actually needed it and she didn't take it seriously right um and i'm thinking like maybe he has a point here but i also kind of understand where nancy is trying to um you know establish herself and and again like why is all of a sudden like she wanting to be this big reporter 
right? So it's like, I don't know. I just feel like the writing's a little on the nose here. It's just kind of unnecessary stuff, a little bit too melodramatic. Um, but anyways, after all, I mean, it's an okay scene. The way it plays out. Um, and I think Jonathan does have a point here, but I also think Nancy does too. Now, one thing I will say is, didn't they already learn this lesson that the writers are trying to put them through this season? Didn't they already learn this last season uh, with the conspiracy guy on how to track a story and how to sell that story to people? Like, you know, the whole water it down thing of season two, which again, I didn't love in season two either. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, and it's like, didn't they already learn this lesson? Like, wouldn't they already know, or at least would Nancy know at this point, okay, water it down so people could actually believe you or make this like a little bit more realistic even though you know what the real truth is. Um, and it's just like, that's totally been thrown out the window. Like, that just doesn't matter anymore. I don't know. Me, I got a problem with that, but let's uh, keep going. All right. So, Lucas uh, calls a code red over the radio, so Max and Eleven reluctantly come back, right? Of course, Eleven dumped, uh, dumped his ass, right? Dumped Mike's ass, and Max has also dumped uh, Lucas now, but they all come back for this code red. Uh, but uh, we don't see Dustin, though, as he's busy with Steve and Robin, which I really liked in this episode. Again, you know, maybe a little bit too much of it in this episode, but I did like what they showed us for that. Um, so... We see them kind of get together in Mike's basement there, uh, which is, you know, kind of an iconic location now in the show. Anyway, so Will then tells them how he has felt the Mind Flayer coming back as of recent and explains his theory that maybe the thing that came out of him uh, in, 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 you know, in last season when they kind of extracted the Mind Flayer with all that heat, right? And so that thing that came out of him was perhaps trapped in their world when Eleven went to close the gate. Right, so when she closed the gate, this part of the mind flare tried to get out, but was actually trapped inside, you know, their world, inside the real world, um, instead of the upside down where it was trying to get back to. Um, and so that's an interesting theory, right? But then they write, raise the question of, well, the brain dies, the body dies, right? I think I think it's Mike who says this that the demo dogs died, so why would that thing still be alive, right? Like if every part of the mind flare died as a result of the brain dying. Why would that thing still be alive? So anyways, they're kind of throwing away, throwing around theories here. And I agree with Mike here. I don't know from a writing perspective how that would make sense. Though, I'm sure they'll explain it. And I'm sure it'll all come around and make sense. But at this point, it doesn't really make sense how the Mind Flayer could still be present in their world after Eleven has closed the gate. Unless, unless, what we don't know is that the Russians have already opened up that gate. And that's how the Mind Flayer is back. We don't know, though, yet. Either way, Will says it will be looking for a new host if it is there in Hawkins, right? So Eleven asks, how can you tell if someone is a host? Um, and I thought, I, again, I thought this was a good line, but, you know, a little on the nose. Either way. Um, you know, and we've already seen four of them, right? Like, we've already seen four of these, uh, you know, hosts. And by the end of the episode, we see a lot more. I mean, several more. Um, but at this point, we've already seen Billy, Heather, and her parents, Um uh, you know, at least up to this point. And so Eleven asking that, of course, you know, we know there's already four of them, right? Like, you know, we already have four hosts uh, or probably more than that uh, so far that have already uh, been established in Hawkins. Uh, and so then we get the idea, though, that these hosts seem a little bit different than Will was last season, though. That is something I like, that it's not just a, another Will situation. I thought it was kind of cool that... It does seem a little bit different, the way these hosts are, uh, you know, basically taken, and the way Billy and Heather and her parents now have been manipulated uh, by the Mind Flare. Uh, so that's interesting. They do seem a little bit different, but the way to detect them is still the same, and that's what we see played in this episode. Um, and it's like, it, this scene finally establishes, like, the kids finally know what's going on in the town again, right? And again, it took us to the fourth episode for them to find out something was wrong. Uh, but I really do like this scene and the way it plays out, um, you know, seeing these kids finally realize what has been happening, right? And, and Will's, again, got kind of inklings. I think even in episode one, we saw him feel the mind flare. Um, and so he's kind of picked up on it. It's just been the others that haven't really recognized it because he hasn't told them. All right. So, meanwhile, Steve, Dustin, and Robin enlist the help of Erica. Of course, Lucas's little sister, uh, who has become a big part in this season. I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm here for it. I like it. Anyways, um, 
So they enlist the help of Erica to crawl through the air duct at the mall to get into the room where the Russians are keeping their crates. Hopefully open it up for them to see what's in there. All right. So after she has promised free ice cream for life, um, I like that scene. I thought it was kind of, uh, you know, charming, kind of funny as well. Um, the Erica character is, uh, has, has been good. I, I feel like she's, uh, definitely been, um, you know, again, a, a charming part of this season for sure. Um, so she's promised free ice cream for life from Robin and, uh, Steve, of course, that are working there. And so we see Erica go in to the room. Uh, she gets in there, no booby traps, as she says, and opens the door for them. So they go into the room and as they open one of the boxes, they find this kind of tube. Uh, I, you know, lack for a better word, I, I think that's probably the best, um, a tube, uh, you know, kind of similar, like, the first day I thought it was kind of Jurassic Park, where they take those, you know, like, kind of tubes out of the, uh, uh um, out of the, uh, kind of, like, rotating machines, uh, there, you know, the tubes, the, the embryos and all that stuff, anyways, that's kind of what I thought of, um, and so they take this, I guess, capsule, right, capsular tube uh, of this green bubbly liquid, it looked like. Um, and this little uh, capsule is encased in this big steel tin. And it looks like there's many of them, right? Like there's multiple of these um, capsules or these tubes. Um, and then I like this line um, where uh, I think it was Steve who said, you know, definitely not Chinese food, right? And that's what's labeled on the boxes. So just by seeing that it's not Chinese food, they know that, the, that these people are up to something, Right, uh, you know, obviously they don't know what is in that tube or what that green stuff is, but they definitely know that something is up. Um, and my kind of theory for this right off the bat when they grabbed it out was, oh, like these are eggs, like these are demo dog eggs or something like that. I thought might be uh, what they found, and that still might be what they found, but I'm not sure yet. Anyways, uh, so Robin then grabs the tube and they go to leave. But they can't open the door anymore. So it's really cool. And then we see the room kind of move. Like the whole thing just shakes all of a sudden. So this is really cool. Uh, you know, of course, Dustin's trying to spam the, you know, open door button, right? He's like repeatedly hitting this thing. But instead, the room starts to move. And suddenly, they fall down. Like, I mean, fall down, right? And we see the room is actually an elevator this whole time. It was really an elevator that's connected to the shaft that goes all the way underground. Um, and so then we see the elevator kind of falling down through this, uh, through the elevator shaft uh, down uh, to, we don't know. We don't know yet, but I thought that was a really cool way that played out um, there for sure. Uh, really crazy stuff. So anyways, you know, this whole idea that the room was moving and it's an elevator this whole time. I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, obviously we know that it's going down to something now. Is this kind of a new Hawkins lab? That would be my first thought, but we'll have to see what happens, and uh, we'll have to see how Steve, Dustin, and Robin, and Erica and how are able to get out of this one. I thought it was really cool foreshadowing, too, because Erica says, well, it's child endangerment, and now look what happened, right? This child is endangered at this point, um, and so I really like the way that played out for sure. Um, with that scene. All right. So then we get to a little bit of Joyce and Hopper in this one. So after finding out uh, who the man on the motorcycle works for, uh, from the mayor, Larry, um, I thought that was a great sequence with Hopper threatening him in his office. Um, you know, he just kind of seemed like a sleaze, a sleazy guy, right? This is this mayor, Larry, and he's already kind of asked Hopper to go kind of out of his, I wouldn't say comfort zone, but you know, he, he likes being, you know, nice, cordial to the community and him trying to, and him having to take down those protesters, um, you know, kind of hurt his maybe image among the people anyways. And so he's not too happy with the mayor overall. And, uh, and so he, you know, really great sequence there with him threatening the mayor, you know, popping him in the face a few times and putting his finger into that, um, you know, little device and, uh, and threatening to kind of break his finger off, um, Really great stuff, right? So we see Hopper and Joyce figure out that the people he works for, the, the guy on the motorcycle, people he works for want to buy land in an area of Hawkins, which is located around the town's power plant. And of course, this is, you know, really interesting because that power plant 
really connects back to all the things that have been happening, right? So they drive out to the area and start checking out these abandoned locations to see if they can find the machine that's been making Joyce's magnets fall and also the machine that caused the power outage a few days before, right? In episode one, we saw that when the kids were in the theater, this massive power outage hit the town. And so I thought this was a really, uh, you know, kind of cool way to connect everything that Hopper and Joyce have been seeing. And then this also makes sense, too, why the man on the motorcycle wanted to beat up Hopper, because it looked like he was kind of snooping around and, you know, they they kind of wanted to, you know, basically make him fall in line, right? Um, and kind of agree to the things that they've said. Also, the mayor, very, you know, scared of these people, it sounds like. Uh, he says, you know, these people, you don't mess with these people and all that stuff. So whether or not they're kind of from the old guard from Hawkins Lab or something like that, or they're just these land developers who are developing this, you know, stupid, you know, machine that's been causing these power outages, we're not sure, but I would probably lean towards probably some to do with the Hawkins lab and some to do with opening up the gate again, but we'll have to see. Um, and then my kind of thought is too, at the very end of the episode with them, they're kind of crossing off these buildings and whatever of these locations. We see them go to the one and you know, there's nothing there. It's just abandoned. Uh, and so to me, I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> are Hopper and Joyce on their way to that abandoned building? And I mean that abandoned building, right? The one with Billy and the monster and all the hosts. So I thought this was a really cool way to, to, to end that part of the, the episode and whether or not that actually is where they're headed next um, remains to be seen. I thought that was a really great way to do it though. And what would happen? Like what would happen if Hopper and Joyce got there? Are they just going to, you know, basically die, become doppelgangers just like the others? Are they going to be able to fight back against that monster? I don't know, but it's probably not a good idea if they're on their way to that building. Um, that would not be a good idea for sure. Anyways, so we see the kids then uh, go to the community pool to find out if Billy is the new host of the Mind Flayer as they suspect he is. Uh, of course, we saw this with Eleven and Max being very skeptical of what's going on with him and Heather. Um, and Eleven more so than Max at this point, but Eleven definitely really skeptical, right? Like thinking, well, why was, you know, all this ice in the bathtub and all this stuff, right? Like, why did all this play out? So, when they get there, they find him with a shirt and towel on. Not shirtless. And I love the way that they play this. Like, when is he ever not shirtless? So, I really like that line, too. And we're reminded, I think, by Will here, the Mind Flayer likes the cold, right? It doesn't like it very hot. And so, that could be why he's wearing that shirt and towel. So, I thought right off the bat, it was pretty obvious here that Billy is the host. Of course, to us, we already know he is. But to the kids, I thought it's pretty obvious too. So anyways, they devise a plan to get Billy into the sauna room to test for sure, or to prove, I guess, if he is, in fact, a host. So I really like this. Of course, the episode's titled The Sauna Test, and that's exactly what goes, uh, you know, or, or sorry, what happens in this scene uh, with getting Billy into that sauna room to test if he is, in fact, um, the new host, right? And to them, they, they probably only think there's only one host, uh, right? But we know at this point, there is multiple. All right, so then we see the whole sauna test play out. So later that night, they are successful, and they end up luring him into the room and lock him in. Then we see Will turn up the heat, right? He turns up the heat all the way to 220 to hopefully, I guess what they're trying to accomplish, right, is to see if the Mind Flare actually tries to escape Billy's body right, the way that he did with Will when he was really heated up, right, back in season two. So, we see, at first, Billy gets very angry, right, he, like, spits on the window, yells at the kids to open the door and let him out, right, but then after a few moments, we see him start weeping on the floor, and right away, it's like, we know this is not real, right, like, we know this is a trap, um, but I thought it was pretty good, I mean, it was pretty, it was, it was, you know, I, I maybe could buy it, right? I thought it was pretty good by Billy. Pretty good acting here. Anyways, and so he tells Max that he's done terrible things, but it's not his fault. He says, he made me do it. Now, I don't know if this is actually Billy, right? Like, is this the real Billy somehow, just for a couple moments, coming out here, right? And the Mind Flare kind of letting him out, um, you know, in this scene. Or is this the Mind Flayer or, or, the, or the doppelganger of himself kind of pretending or acting? 
right? Because maybe they know the real Billy and what he would say and stuff like that. So anyways, I thought that was still kind of left up in the air. I thought that was uh, definitely kind of interesting too. To me though, I think the real Billy is completely gone. I think this is just the Mind Flayer controlled version, or at least the doppelganger version of himself. I think the real Billy is gone. I don't think there's any part of him left. Anyways, so Billy says, it's the shadow, right? He made me do it. So just as he starts to get Max believing in him, Will feels the Mind Flayer in the back of his neck again, and just in time, tells Max to move from the door uh, before Billy then breaks the glass and uh, and tries basically stabbing her with this piece of the uh, tile, right, that Eleven, uh, you know, broke off, or sorry, that he broke off, I guess, when Eleven sent him flying into the wall. And then, just iconic in the show, iconic, so he breaks the glass and then the lights start to flicker on and off. Then we see Billy just go insane. Like, the black veins start exploding, over, like, all over on his body, and he just goes, like, insane. Like, just insane, right? And I'm wondering, then, if this is the Mind Flare taking over or taking control of him at this point. Um, I would think so. We saw this very similar with Will last season with those black veins kind of exploding, and all of a sudden, he just, like, gets really uber, like, aggressive and very, um, you know, angry. I guess, or like just insane, right? And so we see very quickly Billy's able to break through the chains on the door. Of course, right after Lucas says, it's impossible, he won't get, he won't get out. Anyways, so he breaks through the chains on the door, but Eleven fights back. She ends up throwing a weighted bar right at his neck, which he throws back to her. Um, this was crazy. So, you know, she throws this bar at his neck. We're like, all right, we're good, we're good. And then all of a sudden, Billy throws this thing's back, like, just throws it back easily, too, and then just starts choking Eleven, even holding her up in the air by the neck and choking her, and we see her, like, trying to control him, but her powers aren't strong enough, like, just really crazy, or maybe that he's choking her, then she can't uh, have the same capability with those powers and she already used quite a bit of the powers before to keep him in the sauna room and then also throw that weight at him too so at this point she is really like weak right now and she's not able to use these powers so Mike ends up hitting Billy off of her um, you know with with some you know piece of steel or something like that um, which was you know saving the day and it's like in this scene I'm like what are you guys doing like everyone's just watching him choke out Eleven Right? It's like Mike finally steps up after like half an hour, it seemed like, of them all watching Eleven getting choked out. But anyways, so he steps up, he hits Billy off of her, right? And then we see that she's able to throw him through the wall, through this brick wall to save Mike, um, you know, after he's about to really let, let out, you know, really let loose on this Mike. Uh, right, for just, you know, hitting him with this bar of steel. And so Eleven's able to, you know, basically recuperate enough power to send him through this wall and save Mike. And then we see him run away into the night. And that's about it, right? And we see kind of Eleven even in tears at this point, um, you know, in, in uh, obviously trying to save Mike here, um, you know, and, and, uh, and also recognizing that, like, her powers didn't work here, right? Like, this... You know, Billy was stronger than her, at least in in, uh, in the way this played out. So, a really crazy scene, and they all look through this brick wall to see Billy running off. Um, and it's like, to me, it's like, you should have chased after him. Like, what are you doing just watching him? Like, go, right? Like, get on your bikes and go after him. Um, and I feel like that's really what they should have done, uh, because we see this next scene uh, to end off the episode. But anyways, I guess they know he's a host now, uh, right? I think that's safe to say. Billy is one of the hosts, uh, for sure, so the sauna test did end up working, and they were able to definitely figure that out. Anyways, so then to end, Billy and Heather back at the building with about now 20 other new people standing in front of the monster. The army is being assembled. I thought this was a really um, kind of chilling and jaw-dropping scene here with all these people from the Hawkins community just standing in front of that monster, almost like waiting for commands. I thought it was really, really powerful. Heather then tells Billy that Eleven cannot kill all of them after Billy kind of voices his concern that, you know, maybe Eleven could kill me. But Heather says she can't kill all of us. Um, really crazy stuff. The army is being assembled. 
awesome stuff to end off this one. All right, so in terms of rating for this episode, I'm going to give this one a 4.2 out of 5, uh, which is relatively low for, I guess, the three episodes so far. Um, I thought the Hopper and Joy stuff was really great. Um, I didn't talk a lot about it just because a lot of this stuff was just you know, kind of predictable, kind of, you know, you saw the way it was going to go, um, but I thought the ending was really great with kind of setting them up that they're going to be going to the building now, um, or, or possibly going to this abandoned building where we know everything is going on, um, and so I thought that was great, the whole thing with Hopper and the mayor was really great, and the whole relationship between Joyce and Hopper has been really great so far this season. Um, to me, I felt like this one was a step down in terms of writing from even episode three as well, but mainly episode one and two. Um, the Duffer brothers wrote and uh, directed those first two episodes as they did, uh, I believe, in season one and two. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I just I feel like there is a difference. I feel like I have noticed a difference between the Duffer brothers writing and and uh, these other writers coming on for these uh, in-between episodes. Um, and, you know, I, and I feel like the direction was fine in this episode. I just feel like some of the writing and some of the plot points in this episode were a little bit just cliche and tropey. And that's what my main problem, uh, if, if that's even a word, but, you know, trope, you know, kind of following those tropes, right? Um, and that was one of my main problems with season two. Um so it's a bit unfortunate to see some of that more familiar writing uh, back in this season, but I'm looking forward to some things for sure. I mean, the Steve, Dustin, and Robin stuff was great. Some of the Eric's, Erica stuff was maybe a little bit extra, but the Jonathan and Nancy one is one I kind of had a problem with in this episode, and one that I just feel like is a little bit more melodramatic and just kind of over the top at this point. Um, now, I do want to say this. It looks like this season, I think we can really confirm it by now, is it looks like it's just going to be more Mind Flare stuff. I don't think there's going to be anything necessarily brand new in this season, um, and that is a problem for me, because I thought going into this one, after season two, you know, basically bring back the same idea of the Upside Down and all that, but pretty much just bigger, like on a massive scale compared to season one. I mean, season one there was really just the Demogorgon, one monster, right? And then season two, they stretched out the Mind Flare, Demo Dogs, and all that stuff, right? And in this season, I thought, okay, like, we're gonna get something different, right? Like, maybe not even the Upside Down stuff, but it just looks like more of the same. And I feel like you had a year and a half, you couldn't, like... You know, you couldn't think of something more original, something more fresh. Um, now, there is a point to, well, it's worked in the past. Why not just do it again? And I totally understand that aspect. I mean, for sure. I mean, it really has worked in the past. It's been very effective. Um, and so, I don't really blame them for doing it again. But I just feel like I, I, I was kind of expecting something more original and fresh this season. And that stuff um, is kind of irking me a little bit. But... This monster is definitely new. That's something we haven't seen. And I'm sure we'll get more stuff and more kind of lore as we go forward in this season uh, for some new fresh stuff. But anyways, just at this point, I'm a little disappointed that they went with this Mind Flare stuff again. Um, and another thing too, and I saw this from other people as well, saying that this season only really gets going in episode four, in this episode. Um, because this is really the only time, or the first time, the kids actually find out what the hell is going on. Um, and again, I felt like in other seasons, uh, in the other two, it really picked up a little bit faster than this one. But I really liked the charm and, and all that stuff in the first two episodes here. Even though not much was going on, I felt like it was really, really great. And developing these characters and showing us what has happened in the, in the year or year and a half that we've been away from these characters. I thought that was really great. So anyways, we're getting into it a little bit late, but I think that makes uh, that makes for a really great and, and really packed in end to the season, which is also really great as well. Fair character for this one, I gotta go with Billy, uh, played by, I, I believe it's Dakri Montgomery, I think is how you pronounce the, uh, the first name. But anyways, um, I feel like Billy is, again, I said this last review, if you told me that Billy was gonna be this much of an integral part of this season... I probably would not have believed you going into it, but he really is, and he's been a really, um, he's been the will of this season, essentially, and I feel like it's uh, a really great uh, way, and I believe this is, is fresh, right, and this is definitely something I'd give the writers credit for in 
really developing this Billy character uh, in order to put him in this situation. And he was really, you know, not a guy you felt sorry for, you felt really anything for, um, maybe hatred or, you know, anger uh, in, in last season. But this season, you actually do feel a little sympathetic to him. And I think that speaks to the writing for sure. And I think uh, Dr. Montgomery's doing an amazing job so far. He did a great job in season two. And I think he's given a great performance here. A lot more depth this season from him, right? Playing a different type of character and a different dynamic for his character. Um, and I think he's doing a really great job. But anyways, guys, that'll just about do it for my review this week. Uh, or I guess this episode uh, for Strange Things. Hopefully we'll be finishing the next four in the next couple days on the channel. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, we'll wrap up the season and, uh, and then kind of share my overall thoughts of the season maybe in another video. But we'll have to see. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching this one again. Love to hear your guys' thoughts of this episode and what you think of the overall season up to this point. Or if you have watched more, let me know what you think then as well. But anyways, uh, we'll see you then for next episode with Stranger Things Season 3, Episode 5.